It's a capital carved out of two different states, a town at the center of a government that doesn't represent them, and a diverse multicultural city known for its unusually high number of geriatric white dudes in power. What is Washington DC if not the land of contradictions? Even its shape seems contradictory. It is, unlike the natural sprawl of most cities, almost a perfect square until it disappears into the Potomac River. But why is DC a perfect square, and where did the rest of it go? Our story begins the same way the musical Hamilton begins if you snuck in during intermission, with the Constitution, specifically the convention that ratified it in 1789. There are many vexing questions that they needed to answer with not a lot of time on their hands. How many votes did states get in national elections? How did congressmen get elected? Are women real people, or are they just kind of fun decorative objects that you can put in your house? But in between these important matters was the issue of the Capitol. After bouncing between Philadelphia, Trenton, Annapolis, and New York City for sessions of Congress, they wisely deduced that sending every member of Congress up and down the East Coast was ultimately going to be at odds with Amtrak's plan to never offer cheap train tickets ever in history, so they decided to establish one permanent capital city to meet in instead. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution states that the nation's capital must be created as a district that encircles the city, which can't be bigger than 100 square miles or 259 square kilometers, and that land must be ceded by one or more states to create it. Representatives had landed on two potential sites in Pennsylvania, one near Philadelphia and one in Lancaster, presumably to capitalize on the untapped Amish labor market for building all those rotundas. The problem was, the convention's southern delegates resented having the nation's capital in a state they considered the North, especially because Alexander Hamilton had been harassing southern states to pay back their Revolutionary War debts at the convention, even though the southern states insisted that they totally were good for it and to just chill out, man. Things weren't looking good, so Hamilton thought up a good compromise that would appease everyone in the moment and annoy everyone in the long term. Known as the Compromise of 1790, the capital would be established in the South in exchange for Southern states indirectly paying off the war debts of Northern states. George Washington suggested the unoccupied parts of Maryland and Virginia on the Potomac River as a good compromise because neither the North or South really wanted it. And what better place to put the nation's capital than a piece of land nobody wants? At the convention, Virginia and Maryland agreed to donate those lands to the U.S. government in a perfect diamond shape that looked like this. DC became established as the required 100 square mile or 259 square kilometer, well, square that included the cities of Alexandria and Arlington within its borders. Roughly 60% of the city would be located in Maryland and 40% in Virginia. By 1800, the move was complete and DC kept the same shape for 50 years until changed by America's third favorite pastime, racism. Trouble started a brewing on the Virginia side in the 20s, with Alexandria experiencing quite an economic decline because the city, much like climate change or members of Congress's children, was neglected by members of Congress. DC still didn't have its own set of laws, which meant that Virginia laws governed the Virginia half and Maryland laws governed the Maryland half. Which, from an urban planning perspective and also from a regular perspective, seems bad in one city, let alone the nation's capital. Plus, both states' laws were frozen in 1801, with zero DC citizens having any political representation, either in Congress or in a special local government. And the Feds' ignorance of the consequences of their actions proved to be their downfall. The district's five jurisdictions, which included Alexandria City, Arlington County, Georgetown, Washington City, and Washington County, didn't agree on how to sort out this negligence, so they each took different courses of action. As Lincoln would say ten years later, a house divided cannot stand. Alexandria City and Arlington County became disillusioned by being part of DC because the federal government had decreed that buildings could only be constructed north of the Potomac, which effectively shut Alexandria out of having any new construction or industry. Meanwhile, DC East was thriving. This meant Alexandria relied on a brilliant economic development tool called enslaving people, and they were worried the United States might, for some reason, decide that wasn't cool anymore. So they wanted to rejoin Virginia to keep slavery legal. Although it took 10 years, Alexandria voted to petition the state of Virginia to take back the land it had donated to DC, which is known as retrogression, and seems familiar. And despite the fact that leaving DC would increase taxes by $20,000 each year, a majority of residents made the classic American decision that they liked racism more than money, and and voted to leave the district. Both Virginia and surprisingly Congress approved the retrocession in 1846, probably because they were too busy trying to keep the United States, you know, united, and didn't care if some whiny racist babies wanted to be reabsorbed into Virginia as long as they were still part of the Union, which meant that no part of Virginia was part of DC anymore. Since then, the metro area has expanded exponentially, but DC itself has stayed the same size, this weird half square, half squiggle, because Maryland won't donate any more land to the district, and Virginia hasn't budged on giving back the land they pledged and then took from the city. And even if the feds wanted to expand DC's borders, which they don't, they'd have to pass it through Congress, which they couldn't even if they wanted to, thanks to the 109th word in this video.
And whether you live in the nation's wonky capital or the lost city of El Dorado, just existing in the year 2022 means you're probably pretty busy. And if you're pretty busy, you probably know that being busy often comes at the sacrifice of eating good and healthy food. But our sponsor, Factor, has a solution for that. They ship healthy, fully prepared meals straight to you. You just select what you want to eat on the app, it arrives on your doorstep, then it takes just two minutes to heat each meal up. For example, last night I ate the Peruvian shrimp bowl, which was probably the best tasting meal I've ever had that took two minutes to make. They also have plenty of optional add-ons that make it super easy to keep your fridge well stocked with smoothies, breakfast items, healthy snacks, ingredients, and more. Factor is owned by HelloFresh, so it offers the same quality both myself and others have gotten used to, while acting as an alternative for those times when you're too busy for any cook. Okay. It's so much cheaper and healthier than delivery your frozen food, especially when you head to go.factor75.com slash HI60 and use code HI60 for 60% off your first Factor box.